Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to the Occult Explorers. I'm your hostess, Snappy, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host and good friend, Dion. How's it going, Dion? Life is good. Glad to be here. Wonderful. So today, this is going to be a fun one. I'm excited. Um, we're doing our episode on the Great Lakes regions and the mythology and spirituality of the Anishinaabe peoples, right? So... As always, before we go deep into this, we got to give our fair warning. You know, a lot of this stuff, when we're looking, first off, as always, we're explorers. You know, we're not, we're not professors. We're not spiritual, religious people. We're, we're, we're exploring stories. We're exploring ideas. And we're talking about the things that we found in our research. You know, so we did our research into the these spiritualities based on the ideas of these various peoples, but there's a lot of issues when when you look into Native American spirituality because so much has been lost or has changed over time. You know, it's like colonialism is a really horrific thing, right, Dion? That is true. This is true, and it's still going on to this day. And exactly. I suspect. Uh, Imagine Elon Musk going to Mars. Is that colonialism? <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not if, there's if there's indigenous <laughs> Martians that can get mad. No, it, it, ain't, this, it ain't ever going to stop. No, and it, <laughs> and it says that, you know, what's it, you know, who's indigenous? Everything's organic. Mm. I would like to pause it. First of all, that sounds weird. What does that have to do with, with humans? But we're all organic beings. We're all from here, you know. Everything's organic and everything's indigenous. And people don't see it as such, you know. Yeah, and the borders, really there's point. no borders. It's like if you could take something, it's yours. Right. This is something that you see when you study a lot of this Native and American um, stuff that you start to come across is that, like, a lot of those concepts were so foreign to the to the indigenous people here, you know. Like, they could not understand the concept of someone owning land well, not that they couldn't understand but it was it just seemed so ridiculous and offensive in some ways right and when we start to look at the especially the religion of the 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 iroquois the haudenosaunee people and in the, their beliefs and their mythology it makes it starts to make a lot of sense like the very idea you know when the christian missionaries come and they interact with this idea they're trying to sell a patriarchal masculine deity who you have to approach through an intermediary and they're this kind of vindictive punishing figure. Nothing could be more alien. Nothing could be seen as more petulant and childish and ridiculous to the, to the, the, the Haudenosaunee. People who democracy and the peacemaker, this great prophetic figure, Dagan Oida, is at the center of their spirituality, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll get into that. And I'd also like to pause it. Um, since, you know, the lakes, Great Lakes unveiled. The lakes are, are entities, are, let's say, people onto themselves. That's why I'm saying organic, that people are organic, is that the separation between person and tree, person and lake um, is less. That's what we're looking at. And that's why we include these characters in our in the stories and mythologies when we explore this stuff. I, we consider like the sacred grove, our volcanoes, no, you that's know, a really islands. A, these are all, a, they're part of the story. A hundred percent. It's really important you pointed out because especially when we're dealing with uh, North American indigenous peoples, they're largely animistic. You know, especially the Haudenosaunee who we're talking about today, they're animistic and they believe that Everything is alive. Like you're basically what you're saying. You know, they saw the Great Lakes as living beings. They see the fish as, you know, there isn't this separation about of, of what's alive and what's dead in the same way we understand it. Everything is is empowered by life, by the great mother, right? You think there's this um, understanding and there's this desire to engage with the natural world in a very direct and immediate way. You know, mm, I like that you said that engage with the natural world in a direct and immediate way. We'll go to the first picture, which that sums it up. Right. OK. Um, 
you know, in our last episodes, we were uh, talking about Africa. Oh, you might have to go back to the beginning there. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, we were talking about Africa in the meteorite in the lake. Right. Lake Bossom tweet in the last video and how it was formed by a meteor impact. And it was part of the Dogon and the Nigerian Ifa uh, mythologies, Senegalese mythologies. Uh, we talked about meteorite worship with the uh, Kaibeli cults. Yeah, the Sibylli cults and yeah, the all Gali. the mother goddess worship in the Saturnian cults. You see Ancient the, Egypt, yeah, uh, Schumer. People like the meteorites because yeah. meteorites have power, impacts have power. They form cataclysmic changes on the ground that lead to positive and negative effects. So we'll take it back a million years, about the same time that meteorite crashed on the other side of the world at, in Africa, in West Africa and Ghana and created that crater, that lake that the Dogon think that the aliens came from a crater or a meteorite impacted Sudbury. <laughs> and I had never heard of Sudbury and you, and you like how you're laughing now. It yeah. must mean something to you. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of family from Sudbury. So where I live is called, uh, is Sault Ste. Marie, which, or, uh, the original indigenous name is Bawading, but it's right at the, uh, it's on the St. Mary's River, which connects Lake. in this map, you can see it connects Lake Superior to Lake Michigan. So I live right in the middle where it says Manitoulin Island, very, just up north from there along the river. So like Sudbury is a hop, skip and a jump from where I live. Um, my ex lived, was, was from Sudbury, you know? So it's like, Sudbury is mostly known as like it's it's a big city now, but for the longest time it was kind of like a mining mining place. Sure. But oh, that's good that you say that. So the meteorite impacts there and spreads tectites in um, pieces all over. So far, far away, you know, half that a thousand miles away, five hundred miles away, all over. And in Wisconsin, and I think at certain places, colleges, they found these uh, meteorite underneath the college at one of these colleges is very are it's a uh, the it's founded on top of a meteorite impact and so it's very special these meteorites they have power and i think uh it's part of the found forming of the great lakes lake superior right. was supposedly an ancient volcano but this is part of the forming of them even though they go back supposedly uh, this region a million years they were connected in a different way you know, are let's say millions of years actually, um, but it's about a million years ago that 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 meteorite hits, and the natives worship the meteorites, the stones. We talked about that different images of stones in the past picture. So let's hit the next picture, and we'll start to go deeper into it. I also just wanted to add, like, there's a lot of growing up around here. I hear so much of this stuff about the Great Lakes and the confluence of the rivers, and how this is. Um, in the new age, they talk about ley lines and right where I'm at, where in between um, the, 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 the major great lakes, they, they can, they view it as this confluence of ley lines. And a lot of that is based off of the indigenous spirituality, but that's more modern new age stuff. I just thought it was interesting that even today people recognize that this is a, a very special point, you know? Oh yeah. Ancient area. And here you could see that I didn't know that before, you know, I didn't do much research up, up until recently that half the lake is in Canada, half the lake is in America. Yeah. <laughs> How does that work if you're swimming? Well, like I can see, I can see from my house, the United States, right? <laughs> and what it, what it is, is that every once in a while, every couple hours, well, more, more like every, you know, every couple of days, you'll see the Coast Guard come by, the American or sometimes the Canadian Coast Guards. And, you know, I, it's not, it's not as policed as you would think. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I learned after right? I started looking at it. How do you, yeah. you could be in a boat fishing and you might just, you could, oh, I'm, I'm in Canada, eh? Well, in <laughs> fact, traditionally it wasn't, it wasn't policed at all. Right. It's only in the more recent years as as you guys got more, um, you know, for when my parents were kids, no one needed a passport. And like 
Uh, I'll show pictures later on, but at Whitefish Island, which is right in the, the heart of Sault Ste. Marie, there's a fishing causeway that goes under the bridge. You can walk the whole fishing causeway to the Michigan side, to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. So people in the middle of the night would just walk the causeway, just hop over well, to you, smuggle all kinds of stuff, everything, you know? They'll eventually <laughs> try to build a wall. You know, you know yeah. how we are over here. We'll build a wall in the middle of the lake if we had our no, way. They got cameras there. <laughs> You know, but people still smuggle stuff. People still, like you can't, you can't. The Great Lakes are so freaking massive, you know. <laughs> and that's what I figured out after I started going into the history of the Great Lakes. There's and UFO UFOlogy. People think that there's UFO stuff there. Oh yeah. The the, the First Nations, Native American stuff. The, there's a lot of history, you know. And we'll get into some of it today. And so, in a previous episode, the Desiree videos, we we talked about Hiawatha. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and we talked about, I showed the, the image of the turtle. The turtle's back had a calendar, and they talk about the concept of Turtle Island and the turtle clans. So I, I want to hit the next picture, and I want to show you something. And here's a turtle island, and there's a few turtle mm -hmm. islands. There's the big ones, and there's the little ones. And this one is in Erie, Lake Erie. Um <laughs> And it's off limits now. You're not supposed to go there as a human. It's a ghost town now because it was. And originally, this was a spot for the Indians to to do their ceremonies and to fish, and get shells and different things. A ceremonial little island, Turtle Island, and the the chief was called Little Turtle. Oh, interesting. Oh yeah, and supposedly it was shaped kind of like a turtle from certain angles. But here you can see the remnants of the ghost town there. And it's off limits because, and I, and I, after I started checking into it, I'm like, wow, there's that many islands in the Great Lakes. I oh, didn't yeah. know that. I did not know Islands that. of islands. So hit the next picture. And so. Well, Lake Superior is almost an inland sea. Like if exactly. it wasn't, if it wasn't fresh water, it would be a sea. <laughs> and people say that at one time it was all a big giant sea. And so Lake Erie right there, you could just see some of the island chains right there. And. And if you look up half these islands, they have ghost stories, uh, disappearing people. There's pirates. You have Native American stories. Um, these it. are sacred islands. There's an ancient history going on here that I didn't know about. I just thought there were the lakes. But no, each island is special. And at the bottom of the Great Lakes, there's like they, they send something like almost uh, between 500 to 1,000 shipwrecks. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. It's like a graveyard of all, underwater, you know, and under these lakes that have other mysteries as well that we'll talk about. So well, I know I know like at Lake Superior, I can't speak to the other lakes, but um, famously the, the undertides when you start to go deep are so dangerous that a lot of these wrecks can't even be recovered, you know, so there are bodies down there, you know, it's like, it's too dangerous, you know, like the wreck of the Edmunds Fitzgerald, the really famous one. Oh, no, yeah. one, no one can even go there. We know where it is, you know, but like, you can't bring up people. You can't, you can't fix it. It's crazy. Oh yeah. So let's hit the next picture. So, so we're talking about Erie and, um, in this meteorite impact and, Copper, mining. Let's talk about copper. Copper is a big thing in the region there. And this goes back at least, people will say, uh, 10,000 years of yeah. copper mining that they've found all these different copper mines all around the Great Lakes area. Here is a, a free floater, a giant uh, boulder, and it has on the outside the patina. I don't know if we've ever talked about the patina, which is the green uh, rust that forms on the outside, which actually has several properties. That can oh, be hard. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's better that it's not shiny. Hmm. Let's just say. And when you got time, look it up. Look at uh, the, the usage of patina on arrows and arrow poisons or patina they used to use and try to use that in medicine. So there's a lot of uh, that green color. And if you were to shine that up, that'd be a nice shiny copper. And the thing with copper tools, why it's hard to date and antique copper tools is because copper is malleable and it can be retooled. And so people will re-smelt it 
and turn it into a different tool, evolve that tool over time, where it's harder with other tools, the iron, because you got the Iron Age, Bronze Age, Copper Age. And so copper was big with the Indians. People don't know how big it was. So the Great Lakes area, five to 10,000 years ago, was beaming with activity with multiple tribes across all of North America with megaliths, copper mining, and a lot of wild mythologies, you know? Um, let's hit the next picture. What's cool, I just wanna add what's cool with the copper stuff is now a lot of modern um, anthropological work has been looking at this heavily and they found um, copper from these sites going down south to Mexico. Right. Oh, this yeah. is one of, these are one of these items that was traded that we can trace as a trade item. The same with peyote, which you had mentioned. They found peyote up up here around, you know, and it's like there's no way that they're growing that <laughs> anywhere around here. So, and part of the thing is, you know, uh, with the copper mining, you can find all those weird, like we talk about ancient alien videos. You're going to find different videos that'll say that that it's. Um, the Vikings set that up. If they were Viking copper mines, or that those were ancient Egyptian copper mines, and they took, you know, 500 million tons of copper to the other side of the planet, or what have you. There's a lot of wild stuff. So right. you know, you're onto something when they're making weird ancient alien documentaries about the area. Right. And so we're just looking into what's be before that, before these weird videos. And so that has a little patina U on it right there. And this is a statue of a uh, Tadadao. We talked about Tadadao in a um, previous episode. And the myth was that Hiawatha, um, and, you know, I'm saying that, the, the, like when I say Iroquois and Hiawatha, these are the names that were assigned to them by other people, not their yeah. own traditional names. Like, on a show, you know, can you, you could say the name correctly even better than me. Yeah. It's a, so it's the, 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 the name for the language group is Anishinaabe, which you were saying. The people, they call themselves the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse. And then that's the, the, the tribal confederacy, which what we know is the Iroquois confederacy. And then this guy is Adadaro, you know, and Ayawantha. But, but it's almost the same, almost right. the same. Right? So and, Ayawantha then, is Hiawatha which you've yeah. heard of the, the famous Native American story. And Hiawatha means he who combs because he was a cannibal. And Dekanawada, Dekanawida, the great peacemaker of the area, the Great Lakes, comes to him and um, gives him wisdom and puts, on a, puts him on a mission to tame all the, the tribes and bring them together and have a confederacy. And Tadadao, his tribe, is pretty badass and he's not going for it and he's famous for having snakes in his hair because you know in previous episodes we talked about Medea and snakes in the hair and these, these uh, the archetype and the mythologies of it and so I wanted to show you one and I found one with some patina on it because the copper patina just to tie it in and here's a statue dedicated to Tadadao and we'll hit a next picture and drive it home yeah here he is a uh, smoking the pipe tobacco was a big thing amongst the tribes and they did have almanita muscara as well as a uh, calamus they're big on the calamus the sweet flavor yeah. of course so you can see the snakes right there snakes in the hair and in the myth hiawatha makes peace with them and combs the snakes out of his hair and tames them yeah. And brings peace to him. And then he, and he becomes the leader of the tribe. The bad boy becomes the actual leader of peace. Yeah, so it's in interesting. So we'll unpack a little bit of this. So if you can get the next picture before you unpack it. Sure, of course. Sorry. Oh, that's a great one of them. Yeah, <laughs> Tadadaro. Right. So like the Deganawida, the great peacemaker. You know, he's a really important figure. I want to, we're going to do an episode deep diving into this because it, it, it needs to be fully understood. For the Haudenosaunee, he's sort of like a prophet, the closest thing they have to a prophet. And um, to put that modern, like to put that into context, the modern Baha'is, some of them actually regard um, 
the digging Awida as an actual prophet of God, according to their religion. He meets the signs of the bah of the Bab, the Baaluya, right? Which is so interesting. But so this digging Awida figure, they're the ones who create the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And they had this vision of peace, this great vision to unite uh, um, the seven nations, the seven different tribal groups together. And all of these groups are kind of in perpetual war with each other. And like you brought up, some of them are cannibals. Famously, the Mohawk, as we talked about, were, 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 were described as cannibals, you know. And Hiawatha was a cannibal figure. Well, this guy Diganawida, the great prophet, hooks up with this incredible woman named Jiganase. And together they establish the first kind of tribal councils. And he makes her the, the appointer of the chiefs. And together they, they realize they need to get the leaders of all of these seven different tribes to come together. And in order to do that, they need Hiawatha. So the great peacemaker, being the great orator, he tells a tale of peace and shares his dream. And this convinces Hiawatha to give up his cannibalism, you know, to give up his ways and to, to join up with him in Jiganase. And he goes, like you said, on that mission. And um, Adedora is a tribal chief. He's the leader of the Onega or, or, or on Oneda people, I believe. That's how you say it. Excuse me, anyone, if I'm mis mispronouncing things. We're trying, you know. Um, but yeah, so he was a leader of another people. And like you said, he's described as having red hair, stone skin, snakes in the red hair, snakes on his fingertips. You know, he's kind of like this really terrifying figure at first. But what's wild is after Hiawantha confronts him and captures him and forcibly removes the snakes from his hair, they see this as like uncluttering his mind, getting his mind away from all of this toxic belief and toxic magic and getting him to conform to society and be a good person. And what's wild, like you did say, is that uh, Tadaro Adadora or Adadaro he becomes the first leader, the first appointed chief, Jiganase appoints him as the first leader of the great confederacy. And then he goes on to become like the sort of like um, archetype of a good tribal leader, you know? So when he was the leader of the Oneida, he was a cannibal, he's doing this black magic, he's this terrifying figure. But after he goes through this transformation with Hiawatha, he becomes this this great chief, this this leader, you know, it's it's a really powerful story. Mm, mm. You know, and mind you, for those who have ears to hear, they did have arrow poisons. And they did have a lot of the same elements that you'll find up in the other part, part of the world, you know what I'm saying? Our media up there, you know, Georgia, different Georgia, let's say. Right. So in the next picture, the same, we get the same kind of... This was something we were talking about. It's not the same, but it's synchronistic, right? Well, you know, giants that are red-haired with with arrow poisons, you know, who can turn their skin into stone, right? Who, who live in hair. caves, who worship who worship snake women. Like it, it, the, the the similarities are very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering, is there an older archetype that we can connect that to, and and where are these archetypes, you know, of the snakes and the hair? Here you have a uh, Yachishion, and this is Mayan. This is a Mayan, uh, the the dream serpent with the with the serpents in the hair, and they did take their mushrooms and they did practice cannibalism, and they did have a lot of the same little elements, yeah. you know, these tamers of society who are both peacemakers yet come from a darker past. Um, right. Hit the next picture. And you, it's interesting you brought up the Amnita because uh, tons of different species, mostly the yellow ones, but you can find Amnita muscaria all over the place around here. Like mm -hmm. I'm probably not getting the right genius, but it, there's all kinds of different types of Amnita and then various types of psilocybin producing mushrooms as well. So you know the indigenous people are doing those. Um, lots of Datura, right? And there's all these myths surrounding Datura, specifically the Jimson weed. You know, oh, and there's snakes in air, right? 
Here's another figure who's doing Amnita mushrooms, who's doing Detura, who's got snakes in his hair. Similar? Similar? I wonder. We've got the arrow toxins or arrow poisons there. You know, it, it's... Yeah. Uh, and cannibalism, too. Right? The you this, yeah, you have the similar associations. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I can see a synchronicity of snakes and hair, cannibalism, psych certain psychedelics. Um, yeah. There's just there's just a synchronicity there. I don't know. We can prove nothing. There's no ancient text here. <laughs> no, this is stuff that's. If there is a connection, we're this is way into the deep into the deep speculative history, you know. And it's not for us to say. Right? The connections in your subconscious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dream serpent. <laughs> you know what it is. It, 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 I mean. People, if you go on to like go on to Arrowhead and read some trip reports about Datura, specifically about like Jimson weed and stuff, or Moon Moonflower, and you will be appalled, shocked. It's terrifying, right? Yeah. So any 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 community that is ingesting those kind of drugs, you know, it's going to give them a certain kind of color to their mythology, right? Yeah. So, uh, oh, oh, sorry. No, go go to the next picture. There you go, Wendigo. Okay. Yeah. So, this cannibalism. Some people are afraid to talk about it. They're grossed out by it. Some um, some scholars will say it's fake. Some will say that's yes, you know that's all they ever did. Whatever. Um, there is history. There's myths, and part of it is Wendigo. Wendigo, which was a character, a creature that had horns that was a cannibal and can infect others to be, make them into cannibals. And you'll find this, the myths of this ancient being around the Great Lakes, with the horns in the head, like we might see in another part of the world as well. Yeah, as soon as you showed me this image before we went live, my immediate thought was, doesn't this remind people, at least it reminded me of Cyrano's. Or the uh, figure we see um, in the Harappan civilizations, the Harappan seals, that proto-Shiva. But this yeah. is like a, a very primordial kind of image of that wild man of the woods with the, the horns, right? That horn god figure, you know, that you also see in the, in the Celtic, right? So this is very primordial. But it's interesting that within a lot of the North American indigenous groups, this figure is associated with the dark, with the cannibalism. It's not a, it's not a good figure, you know? And um, we have to also just have a realistic talk when we're talking about cannibalism, you know, especially if you're talking about Canada, like where I'm from, like <laughs> it's just a reality, you know? If you go up into the, into the North, it is not a forgiving country. It is not. It is not for the easy people. And there are plenty of, of stories all across history of people being, being forced to resort to cannibalism, indigenous or otherwise, just to contend with the, the harsh, rugged reality that they're faced with. So mm. cannibalism is just a reality of life. We, it's something like, and like we also talked about, headhunters, and the ingesting of like big men or big people, tribal chiefs, shamanic leaders. This is so like ubiquitous across human history. Like it's it's not something that we need to shy away from, you know? It's 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 something that most ancient cultures were engaged in, at, at least to some degree, you know, and a lot of cultures evolve away from one of the things I want to talk about with the with the uh, the Haudenosaunee is all of the myths are about breaking away from cannibalism, right? The people who practice this are Wendigo. They're evil. They're scary, right? Um, we don't want to have snakes in our hair, you know. We want to <laughs> we, we want to come join and conform to the great peace, you know. Mm. Like it, like it. Well, speaking of a. Uh snakes in the hair and horns in the hair uh, in the last episode we talked about uh what was it the the kudo horn how special mm -hmm. that kudo horn is and how victor schauberger figured, figured out some special things and how the zogbot those used it to police the spiritual beings to keep them in line and how maybe like a shofar 
you know, Joshua circle seven times, they blow it, the walls come down, you know, these horns. So the caribou, the caribou figures uh, heavily in the myths in the ancient times there. If you can go to the next picture, we're going to go to our next little lake. So here we're at Lake Huron. And at the bottom of Lake Huron, they found a series of stone walls. There's a lot of these stone walls um, in the area. And some people say it's like a Stonehenge thing or these are ancient temples. But what the archaeologists and the, the real people on the ground really think it is is that these were uh, causeways for hunting. Caribou. They used to route caribou together during the because the animals do migrations. And they don't want to step over the walls, even if it's two or three feet high. And they would route them into a kill zone and kill them. And they found several of these walls, because you'll find walls in the middle of nowhere. And they don't lead to nothing, and they don't protect nothing. It's not high enough to protect anything. But with cattle, it does work, with caribou. And they would chase them and route them and kill them and put some horns, have some sustenance, make some clothes. And so at the bottom of Lake Huron is different rock walls, different formations. And so at the bottom of all the Great Lakes is anomalies. That's when I started typing in, well, what's at the bottom of each lake? I wanted to know. Every lake. I'm like, well, what's at the bottom of all these lakes? Wow. What yeah. did you find? Um, a lot of stone formations and a lot of shipwrecks. And there is a little magnetic anomaly, like the Boston tweet thing, because it, and that's explained with a, the Sudbury impact. Um, and these comments, and there was a comment that came in like in the 1600s, supposedly. There's some other videos out. You can look at that and, and information about some other impacts. Um, you know, when the impacts hit, it changed things up. And things were flooded. You know, if you go to the next picture, That's the bottom of Lake Michigan. See, I found there's lots of videos out. Even Joe Rogan talked about it, about the Stonehenge at the bottom of Lake Michigan. <laughs> People will debunk it. But others, the actual archaeologists who found it, and they will tell you, yeah, it's never what they're saying it is. You know, in the pictures they show you, like if you type in Lake Michigan Stonehenge, the pictures that'll come up are it's actually a shipwreck that's been algaed over, and it actually looks like stone pillars. This is the actual formation. It's in a like an octagon shape. And there's those those caribou walls as well. Interesting. And so what you're gonna find are megaliths, dolmens, caribou walls, um, copper mining. This is part of this culture that got rid of cannibalism. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff going on here with the tribes yeah. there that yeah. you wouldn't even know about. You know, and this is before that the water, and this goes back a long time for it to be that way. And so be careful when you do type in the Lake Michigan structures, because you're going to come up with a bunch of other fake stuff. That'll say, oh, it's a line to the Stonehenge in England and, you know, and that's as of cool. now, they're trying to keep it people away from there. Yeah, that's so interesting. I'll have to look more into this. I just wanted to add, like when you were talking about the uh, the, the cannibalism, it's not like yeah, cannibalism becomes a taboo in the mythology. And, you know, the mainstream people aren't aren't practicing it. But as you pointed out in, our, in one of our earlier episodes, we have overwhelming um, evidence, firsthand accounts from, from people talking about um, indigenous people in the 16 and the 1700s who were engaging in cannibalism, you know, um, during the, the early colonial period. So it's almost certainly still being was still being practiced among the warrior elite, right? And it seems to be this idea of consuming the essence of uh, of your of your enemy, you know? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, uh, let's hit the next picture. Here's another island, Beaver mm -hmm. Island. We've talked about this one several times. <laughs> you know. Um, is that strong? Is that how do you say his name? Is it strange or strange? Strang. Strang. James strang. L. Strang. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> who was a Mormon, a good Mormon boy who went to Beaver Island and started his own cult. He's on now I'm gonna start my own. <laughs> right. So to catch people up to speed, if you remember from our Mormon episodes, after Joseph Smith died, James L. Strang sort of uh, forged a letter that by Smith claiming that he was the next in line to be the next prophet, then claimed he found his own magic golden plates on his farmstead. Well, he managed to get a, con a pretty significant amount of the Mormons at that time to come join him as well as uh, John C. Bennett, who was Smith's uh, doctor and, uh, you know, poor, performed all his abortions for him. Those two, they ran off and they went looking for their own paradise, right? This idea of trying to find the new um, Eden, right? And uh, they went to Beaver Island. And uh, on Beaver Island, Strang established his own commune and he declared himself king. You can look this up. He was the only king in North America, right? This was a, a huge kind of insult to the American government at the time and to the Canadian government too. And, you know, they were notorious in this area too for engaging in piracy. They would go up and down the, the, the coasts of the Great Lakes, usually into Canada because they could get away with it more easily. And they would raid people who they considered Gentiles, non-Mormons, you know. Eventually, Strang wound up getting sick and died. And a, a bunch of his co-conspirators admitted it was made up. And the plates never got found. And there are still some people who live on Beaver Island to this day who, who practice Strangite Mormonism. But uh, it's a very small, small insular group. <laughs> uh, yeah. And when they got there, they weren't very pleasant to the natives. To the First Nations, you know, if, if you know your Mormon history, they first they try to indoctrinate them, and then next they genocide them. And a lot of people don't know about that, that wherever Mormon colonies end up, the natives kind of like disappear. Yeah. You know, not only are they digging up things, they're putting things in the ground, let's just say. And there was also the Beaver Wars. And so there's ancient history on the island that go back with the Indians, you know before before strong strong ever got there you know yeah. there's, there's a lot of wild stuff and you're talking about pirates the pirates of uh the great lakes people thought it was just in the caribbean you know jack sparrow they were pretty wild out here in the great lakes if you know the history of the pirates there i didn't know how much piracy was going on <laughs> you know and they, yeah. and they had schooners they had different boats. They didn't have those regular pirate ships. They had schooners. And um, let's hit the next picture. Here's one. It's called a whaleback. And this is one of these boats that would be on um, the Great Lakes. They had these different experimental boats on the Great Lakes. You know about your ships. And like you said, a lot of shipwrecks, a lot of pirates. There was luxury liners where you could just go and just sell um on the great lakes there were like these floating uh pleasure hotels where you can gamble and um eventually when people got cars that's when the, that's when they started stopped all the big boats on the great lakes but at the time it was a big thing you would go out of the great lakes and take your vacation oh. and sail on these boats and have little ports of call and this is still a thing that happens. So, okay. like, uh, I I live right on uh, St. Mary's River, and I see the American tour boats. They usually are also have casinos on them and drinking, and they ride that border, you know, <laughs> because uh, you can't do that here in Canada, and it's a lot of Canadian tourists, <laughs> some American too, and yeah, you, they ride up these rivers. It's it's like what you used to see on the Mississippi back in the day, <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, there was a whole culture up there. Yeah. And these are these are these uh these boats these whaleback boats. You know, it's a special type of a boat. So let's hit the next picture. Interesting. Oh, what's this? Oh, that's an ice volcano. Okay. <laughs> you ever heard of an ice volcano? No. <laughs> yeah, they have my Lake Superior. Oh gosh, I think I would know this. <laughs> lake Superior, the biggest lake in the world. Yeah which was a sea at one point, which was hit by a meteorite a million years ago. Wonder if it's that same meteorite strike that hit the other part of the planet and created a lot of change in the planet. Different life forms, like biodiversity. There was a tsunami. Uh, 
you have magnetic rocks, you have anomalies. And in a lot of these areas, you have mining years later. It's just part of uh, the evolution. You know, and and people will say that Lake Superior at one time was a volcano. Unlike the other Great Lakes. Lake Superior was a volcano, supposedly, an extinct volcano. And then, like I said, the Great Lakes shapes, it was two big lakes at one big time, and it that meteorite changed the shape. You know? Yeah, but yeah. Wild. And there's more to Lake Superior. So let's hit the next picture. Once again, what's at the bottom of Lake Superior? What's at the bottom of all these lakes? This is called the Lake Superior Anomaly, which is a giant shape. And this my, mind you, this is like a mile or a mile and a half or half a mile wide and, you know, width. And some people say it's a natural formation from a volcanic eruption or a meteorite strike. And others will say it's a one of these ancient structures. You know, it depends if what channel you're watching. Right? Who knows? <laughs> And, and as we were yeah, saying, it's a, hard a to go the, down there. It's hard to yeah, go down there. A lot of the exploration you can't do. Because they tried to go down there for a <laughs> yeah. different part. And some people say it's an underwater submarine base or this is where the ancient aliens land because there's so much UFO sightings over the Great Lakes. You could type in all these videos and see lights and stuff, and it's just a normal thing. But there's well, something over the Great Lakes is its own thing. That's like an environmental phenomenon that happens. They don't know how to fully explain it. Oh, well, Similar to the light. Like, yeah, we just look out the window. It's just a thing that happens. <laughs> it's <laughs> the same thing about you. You heard of the Appalachian lights in that mountain range? Like sometimes these lights, these light shows, just naturally happen, and to this day, scientists don't know. You know, there's right. a lot of speculation, right? There's right. a lot of weird anomalies. I remember too, like around here, you can find there's these types of these rocks around here where if you shine a black light on them or a certain kind of light, they start to glow, you know? Yeah. So as kids, we used run up and down the river with lights at night trying to find them. <laughs> yeah, so there's them. a lot in, in the, off the Great Lakes and Lake Erie. Yeah. Like, and there are all these different fancy colors and shapes and little... And I'd never heard of pudding stones. I was like, what is this? I'd never yeah. heard of this phenomenon. Well, Lake Superior, Lake Inferior. What's Lake Inferior? Lake Inferior is the underwater lake underneath Lake Superior. What? And the people say that's crazy. And so once again, everything we're talking about, you're going to go online and find two schools of thought, people arguing over it. Like, no, and yeah, an ancient alien. But... They try to find out, well, is there a, a lake down there at the bottom? Some caverns and caves. So they sent a diving. This is back in the early, what, 1930s, I think, or something. The dude wanted to go down there and figure it out. And so they put him down there, the divers with the outfits. And I don't know if they got like 1,800 feet or something. And then it was just crazy. Each time he tried to go down there, he said it was just crazy and currents. And he said, but, yeah, there was the water was going, currents of water goes into a cave down there. There's a whole underwater flowing river system, let's say. That's what he thought. And so they they did a big expedition, put him down there, and the third time he disappeared. Oh, wow. So, yeah, they, they stopped that. And so they don't want people going to the bottom of the Great Lakes no more. I remember uh, my dad always tells me this story when he was a kid. The famous explorer Jacques Cousteau came here with his submersible and tried and he got like halfway across and gave up because it was too dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a wild energy. A wild yeah. Great Lakes is very ancient. Once you start studying it, see how it's how you can approach it. Sometimes we can approach it from a geographical point of view, from the anthropological, from the you know, the superstitions and mythologies. It's just which way you want to look at it. But if you just look at it in terms of pure geography and there's magnetic anomalies, there's meteorite stuff, there's the great rifts, there's just in terms of the organic structure itself. Take away the people, just, just the land itself is special and ancient and old. And right. then you have it populated for thousands of years by the First Nations there that were doing mining. But this yeah. just ain't the history that we're being told. 
in the, a lot of the megalithic structures, you know, in mounds, all up and down. And we got yeah. a board, like a line right there. There's a line. There was no lines to the natives before there. There's no lines. That was, lines are just some later thing. You know, okay, so well, there were there were tribal. You know what it was is there were territories. Territories were respected. You know, and there were migration patterns. And uh, you know, some some communities were stationary. Like the Haudenosaunee didn't didn't really move around much. You know, right. other groups were moving around quite a bit. But there was a respect and there was an understanding. You know, it wasn't like a literal line in the sand. It, right. It's more like like it's it's interesting. It's like a you see the same phenomenon when you look at animals, you know, uh, wolf packs will respect each other and won't, won't go into their, won't, won't cross borders. Foxes are similar, you know, <laughs> kind of yep. interesting. Hunting you know? grounds, based on but, hunting grounds. Exactly. So there's like a, you know, people work it out to a certain degree, but like, then we came in and smashed everything, you know, oh, the, yeah. the, the, oh, the colonialists did, you know. <laughs> so let's hit the next picture. Mm. Here we have Spirit Island, and this is not in the Great Lakes. This is off a river in between Minnesota and Wisconsin. And you have Spirit Lake, and you have a that's a what's the St. Louis River, I think what it is. Uh, and this is called Spirit Island, and it's special with the Ojibwe people. And some people say it even looks like a turtle as well. You know, and it figures in the mythology. It, they they did a lot of special stuff on this this little sacred island. You know, there's islands in the middle of the rivers and the lakes, like we're talking about. They're special. If you can yeah. get yourself to an island, you can do special things, special energies, um, different flora and fauna. I think on this little island they had a special plants and a lot of different game. So it's seasonal. Like people move around. That's what you talk about. Um, you might have your winter grounds and your summer grounds. Because if we're, when the snow, who wants to live in the snow? You know, when you're camping in the snow, ain't fun. So you oh, go yeah. Look, this, is, this is something that becomes so insane. Like uh, my brother is married to an Inuit woman. And um, she tells me all this stuff like her people originally, you know, like they now live on in... in in uh, Nunavut, which is in the far, far north on like Baffin Island. But traditionally, her people largely lived in, in around uh, the, 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 the James Bay, you know, much further south, you know, they would go up to the extreme far north to go hunt whale, but they wouldn't stay there all year. And now we've completely changed it so that they're basically on these islands all the time. And at one point, our government even first forced them even further north because the islands were contested by the Russians because no one was living there. So we went and populated it. And of course, most of the people died, you know, no. it's, it's, it's just so scary. But our, you know, my government thought, well, you know, the Inuit are used to living up there. They can handle living in the absolute extreme. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no one can, you know? <laughs> right. Right. And the whales are a lot part of it, you know, yeah. um, the whales figure in a lot of different mythologies amongst the different the different tribes there. So let's hit the next picture. Oh yeah, there so we now go. we're getting into uh, some pictures that that I took. So actually, I took this one today. So this is of um, a sacred river or sacred falls. So with the Ojibwe people here, where I live, um, they're the they're they're the largest tribal group. And they have a thing about the the falls, these rivers. They're always of the mother goddess, you know. And the foam is is uh, specifically this this image of the foam, which I thought like people like like Doc will really appreciate. But they also they always come to these sacred these sacred waterfalls specifically for peacemaking and for signing of treaties. So I wanted to include this one because to this day, the the Ojibwe people come here. To, to, to make peace. And um, so when we when they re-sign any new agreements with the Canadian government or anything, they first have to go and consult the waters, you know, and make sure that the mother goddess is included 
in 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 any 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 agreements that are signed. So I thought that was pretty pretty powerful stuff, you know. And this place is just, yeah, the most beautiful one of the most beautiful sites I've been to around here. And it's just like right off the highway, you know. And that foam is a uh, Aphrodite, right? Yeah, exactly. The sea, the sea foam. Aphrodite is the sea foam. Well, it's kind of interesting that the you know the people here look at the water foam again as this representation of the goddess, you know. Um, and then this is a really interesting spot. We've been talking a lot about the uh, the trade that was going on along the Great Wakes, Great Lakes. Well, this particular spa spot, Whitefish Island. Um, it's right near where I live. It's Sault Ste. Marie, Bawading. And this was the largest trade center for the Haudenosaunee people. This was also a major fishing spot. They would come out here to catch the whitefish. And there's all these stories where they say the whitefish were so populous that you could cross the entire river, you know, on the backs of the fish. And uh, we have like stories of the Jesuit missionaries who were here and they would talk about how in the winters, the, the the population around whitefish would shrink to about like 150 people. But then by the time of the summers around the sturgeon moon, which was just the last full moon we have, we had when they're when they're really doing the massive fishing, the, the population would surge to almost 2,500 people, you know, and there would be people from all the various tribal groups of the entire area all coming to trade and to to participate in the in the fishing. And um, this is one of the spots where we found peyote, you know, Mexican peyote we found on Whitefish Island, which is, it's like, so it's showing you that there's this direct connection all the way down south, you know, at least that like people are moving these group, these, these, these things up. And then as you brought up, people found um, copper that was, that was brought from around this area all the way down in Mexico, so. As well as the obsidian um, arrowheads that don't, yeah. the obsidian doesn't come from there. No, <laughs> and obsidian, again, is a big thing around here because of the meteorite, you know? There's a lot of obsidian and, it, and it's a sacred thing, again, they use that in all their cutting tools, it's, uh, you know? And oh, it, yeah. It's kind of wild how everywhere we go, the mother goddess is the same kind of associations, you know, <laughs> the, the same things, you know. So this is the bridge to get to. This is the modern bridge here, what it looks like to get to Whitefish Island. Um, most of Whitefish was closed. So this is what it looks like now. There's a massive beaver dam there. There's a lookout. Most of it was closed because the waters were too high. So this is here. This is showing you um, that's the main uh, shipping track to go to the American side. And, this and, is, and I'll let people know that beavers, um, I, I didn't mention before, but beaver pelts is a big part of trade. Yeah, huge you know, part of trade. That's their income. That's their beaver pelts, salt for meats, salting things, um, copper. There were so many things being traded. It, it was This is the industry uh, of the North Americas. This was like... Especially when the when the tribes came together, the con the Confederacy of Peace, you know, the the abundance multiplied once the blood feud stopped. And that was the big thing, right? The great peacemaker, his whole thing was he saw that we could just all coexist. We didn't need to engage in this tribal war. We needed to, you know, put aside some of our more extreme practices. And and you know, and the big thing, like I said, was um the setting up of the women, that Jeganase as the uh, the pointer of chiefs, and this idea, right? They set up the longhouse, right? The longhouse is the center of the community, and communities could have like four or five to to hundreds, if not thousands, of longhouses. And in each longhouse, you would have an entire family family group, usually centered around a matriarch, like a great grandmother figure. And then all of her children would have their families in there. And that matriarch, what she would do is each longhouse would select a, a man, you know, who would then go represent the people, right? But you had to be selected by these women from each longhouse. The clan you know? mothers. Exactly. Because each, each one represented a, an animal that had a different totem, let's say, you know. Yeah. We talked about before, turtles was a big part of them. That's why we're bringing up turtles a lot in this episode. 
just to well, pay this was home another home. An interesting thing that I thought uh I wondered like so much is lost you know um and we do have reconstructed stuff like I don't want to discredit or a lot of what the the people do now is hidden but I wonder how much a lot of these clan magic is similar to the various types of mysteries because each one of these clans would have their own different version of magic, their own sacred traditions that would be passed within each clan. And these clan names are super, super important. You know, it's it, it, and it's an additional identity on top of your tribal identity. So these people would be, I'm a Haudenosaunee, right? Person of the longhouse and I'm an Ojibwe and I'm from Turtle Clan, you know? Yeah, 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 definitely. Right. So it's 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 such an interesting thing. But yeah, so this is uh, right over there is America. <laughs> you see the guys fishing here, always fishing around here. But these rapids were the Sioux Rapids were seen as like the most sacred spot. This is where the peace was held right at Bawading at these rapids. This was this is the mother goddess, you know. Oh. So. And here's another uh, sacred fall that's near me. This is in a place that's called the Hiawatha Highlands. Now, this is something we see a lot of places get named this, and it's mostly by um, later um, like colonial peoples, like like my ancestors, not the indigenous names, because um, of a really popular poem that, that tells us, Longfellow. Yeah, Longfellow that talks about um, you know Hiawatha. It, it kind of elaborates on the story of Hiawatha, but there's a lot of like. Uh, misconceptions too you know it's not a it's not a complete fabrication but you know it's like a historical fiction is what i'll call yeah. it like there's the creation of a new character instead of uh Jiganase, there's the there's the woman a princess called mini haha you know so, Lake Minnehaha. right you see you'll see things named hiawatha and mini haha especially if you go down to minnesota it's like a big thing around there you know um so Ooh. yeah this this is a really, really important spot. This is, I try to make a pilgrimage out here whenever I can. This is Agawatha or the Agawa Canyon. So for the Ojibwe, this is the most sacred spot on earth. Um, this is where the, the shamans would go to, to meet the thunder god or well, the thunderbird, which was after the mother goddess, the great mother earth was the most important deity. That was the, the, the child of the mother goddess. And it's kind of like this dragon type figure or a bird type figure. We'll, we'll see the art in a second. But these are the modern um, stairs that have been carved into the rock to get you down to this cliff because it's in the middle of this gorge and it's incredibly dangerous to get down here. And it's on the side of this like sheer cliff face we'll see here. But these pictographs are the oldest in North America, 20,000 years old. So this is the cliff face. So this further down around the around the corner here, this is where all of the pictographs are painted. So to get down here, you have to put your hands on that on that cliff wall, where, you know, where you see that space is at the top of the picture, and you kind of have to shimmy along. <laughs> sometimes there's a rope, sometimes the rope is gone, but yeah, people have died out here. It's pretty crazy when the tides come in, but it's also just like it's the most magical place I've been to outside of India, <laughs> you know? So here's a here's a, a shot from the outside so you see the full, full cliff, you know? And this is where the tide is pretty high because normally you can walk right out onto the other side there. Um, so here's some of the pictures that I took. Um, here we have like, um, there's a lot of debate over what these what these kind of figures are, you know? But this seems to be some kind of magical caribou type figure. We always see the the ubiquitous canoes and in, in boats, you know, and a, a lot of these fish figures. There's also human figures here. Um, this is the most famous picture, the one that gets a lot of written about. This is the so-called Thunderbird. Doesn't look like much of a bird, though. Uh, <laughs> people like to call, uh, you know, there's also people like to call it the Mastodon around here or the dinosaur. You know, there's all this... Uh, weird kind of uh, stuff that goes on with this image. But the, the indigenous people, the Ojibwe, they call this the Thunderbird. And he rides on a snake at the bottom there. And uh, 
he has a bunch of snakes with him, you know, and then there's this, again, we see the image of the, uh, of the sacred canoes, you know, and there's always this talk about them riding the canoes across the, um, you know, the stars and, and, and specifically they have this connection with the Milky Way, you know, and, and they, they, they connect the Milky Way again to that image of the, of the sea, of the water, foaming water, you know, this of the mother goddess, right? It, that image is, is, is very, very important there. And the Pleiades. Yeah. They, and the Pleiades. It figures in their, their mythologies. Yeah. And the Pleiades is really interesting too. One of the things that is kind of interesting is that you'll also see this kind of question mark symbol around. And that's actually the, the, the symbol of the Pleiades because the Pleiades, the way that they, the, the Ojibwe connect them as a, as a constellation, it forms a question mark. And mm -hmm. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Oh, the Pleiades uh -huh. are a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, here's some more um, interesting figures going on. Um, Again, we have these like always these kind of like horse like kind of caribou like images, you know, and the boats and these 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 fish, you know, lots of stuff about the sturgeon because the sturgeon is the biggest fish around here. Right. And it, that was what everyone wants to catch. You know, it was what the most everyone was afraid of, too. So and there's another shot of uh, the Thunderbird. And yeah, that's that's what we got for pictures today. <laughs> That deserves a like and a share and a subscribe right there. Right? Yeah. You yeah, you went to the to the sacred sites yesterday, huh? Yeah. Love I tried it. to Love make it. make it to as many as I could. They're hmm? a bit they're a bit far. Like uh, Agawa is like two hours from right. where I am. Chippewa Chippewa is like forty five minutes. Hiawatha is really close. I could walk there. But yeah, <laughs> it's sad though. Like at Hiawatha. Um, most of the falls have been turned into a hydroelectric, you know? So what was once sacred is now, you know, it is, it's powering the city, but, you know. Well, it was, been, yeah, it had that energy, it had that spark. You know, yeah. but it's been transformed. It's, it's, mm. it's you know, uh, I'm hoping, I'm trying to connect with people around here to learn more. So there's a bunch of uh, community outreach things that go on around here where they do like walkabouts and they talk about the local history. So, Expect part two, yeah, this yeah. Talk, where we'll specifically, like I said, we want to get into that story of Degan Wadida, the uh, you know, the Bring great peace peace maker. and uh, Tadadora, you know, the the evil necromancer with snakes in his hair. There's more to that story that we need to unpack. And some and, things uh, I want to get into is the old man on the mountain, right? You had and, mentioned and as well as a poverty point, and there's you know, there's a lot of, we got a lot of First Nations stuff coming. Yeah, and that's always an interesting thing. The mountains, this is something we didn't talk about because the Great Lake peoples, there's not, there are mountains around here and they are sacred, you know, but not like some of these other communities that you see where they're in a more mountainous area, you know, especially like the peoples near the Rockies, you know, or further down south. You get some, I know like there's so much about um, a lot of the sacred mountains that got destroyed by your culture, Dion, like famously Mount Rushmore was a sacred place that got transformed. There's that, there's that famous um, carving of the great chief, which the indigenous people don't even want. It's like their cultural figure, but they destroyed their <laughs> sacred mountain right. in order to, in order to carve their sacred, this, 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 this great person into it. And uh, yeah. Mm. Well, that's right, folks. We'll we'll join us next week as we explore more mysteries. Leave some yeah. comments, like, subscribe, and you know, have a blessed week. Yeah, thank you guys all for tuning in. Um, you know, we're the occult explorers, uh, and yeah, hey Satan. Until next time, take care. <laughs>